Aujourd'hui à la MGM, Richard Brooks termine le montage de son nouveau film, Fever. Brooks est le metteur en scène de quelques-unes des œuvres les plus singulières du cinéma américain d'après-guerre. Bas les masques, graines de violence, douze oiseaux de jeunesse, de sang-froid, les professionnels, à la recherche de M. Goodbar. Ancien scénariste devenu réalisateur dans les années 50, quand il parle d'Hollywood, c'est avec la même efficacité que l'on retrouve dans les dialogues de ses films. At the time uh, you uh, you went from writing to directing and both, uh, was it uh, usual for a, um, a writer to become a director, or was it even de desirable? No, it was, it was desirable, but not. Uh, no, it wasn't usual. As a matter of fact, it came about very strange. Would you like to hear about it? Sure. Um, I was working with John Huston on Key Largo. He was to direct it. We were down in Key Largo. I would write in the mornings, he would go fishing, and he'd come back, and he was marvelous, you know. John is special. Anyway, at the end of the picture, he said, um, why don't you stick around, kid, and uh, maybe, you know, you should be around the set in case we need some changes. He said, they won't pay you, but at least you'll see how a movie is shot. Up to that time, I'd written half a dozen screenplays, but I had never, never, been on a set or a location where they actually photographed a movie. I'd never seen a movie made. They wouldn't let you? Or? No, writers could not come on the set. Why? Well, they always ask, why are you changing things? So they didn't allow me. I didn't like them to be around. If you were a very important writer, maybe I was not important. Anyway, I said to John during the shooting of the movie, what do I do if I don't have John Houston? to uh, direct a movie. And he said, well, kid, you direct it yourself. I said, suppose they don't let me. He said, don't give them a script. They want your script, you direct it. They was Warner Brothers? Studio, any studio. At that time was Warner's, yes. So, the next day, the cameraman who was a German camera, marvelous fellow, by the name of Karl Freund, stopped by and he said, I was in the corner there rewriting scenes, and uh, he said, I won't attempt his accent. He said, I hear you are going to become a director. I said, well, I would like to become a director, but I don't know. He says, I have for you first lesson in directing. Tomorrow I bring. Next day, he came in with a little brown paper bag. He says, you have a 16 millimeter projector? I said, yes. He says, inside you find first lesson in directing. So I take them home and I run two eight minute movies. And they're both pornographic movies. Two naked ladies, two naked gentlemen with socks, false mustache, long sideburns. They were pretty good, silent, pretty good. I run them twice. <laughs> and I bring them back the next day and I said, Carl, what is the lesson in directing? He says, you know, I make these pictures. Cameraman, director, writer, no actor. I don't act in these, but I make them, Ufa. I said, yes, what's the lesson in directing? He said, you watch these pictures very carefully very carefully. I said, yes, every moment I watch. He says, well, many times you will be thinking, where do I put the camera? Up there, shoot down, maybe under the table. Someplace you'll say, what do I do with the camera? This is the first lesson in directing. Get to the fucking point. Well, <laughs> many times I have thought to myself, where do I put the camera? And I think about this lesson of Carl Freund's. And that's how I got into directing. But when you're directing a movie in the, those days, the 50s, early 50s, you were the enemy. You wanted to do something that the studio felt it should do, which was to say how the picture should look. Even with Blackboard Jungle, Mr. Mayer, who is a very interesting man, by the way, very glamorous. He was a star, not in front of the camera, behind the camera. He was a real star, had a lot of poise, 
He could cry at a moment, just in asking you to do something, burst into tears. In Blackboard Jungle, he said, I don't know about this kind of movie. It doesn't look like an MGM movie. They were looking at dailies. You know, people, uh, they look like they come from the slums. I said, yeah, well, they do. It's the ghetto. He said, but you're making complaints about the, there was a light switch on the wall where they, they entered the classroom. And I went around and I put finger marks on the wall because the kids, when I remember, I went to a class just like that, would reach in for the light, there would be smudges. Every night they wiped them off and made them clean. I said, hey, first of all, it won't match. Second of all, you're changing the aspect of the movie. Then one day, three of them came down, they said, what is this they say that you've got a flag? Somebody's going to hit somebody with a flag? With the American flag? I said, yes. How can you do that? That's unpatriotic, it's un-American. I knew it was a goddamn commie movie. I said, if you were in a battle, in a war, and the enemy is coming at you, and the only thing you have, you don't have a weapon anymore, you'd hit him with a flag, you'd hit him with anything. That could be the best thing to hit him with. The best symbol there is. He says, you think so? I says, I think so. So even in small matters, there was always somebody. Somebody was always coming around saying on, on Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, standing, the camera is about the level of four to five feet from the ground. And there's a shot of Elizabeth Taylor shooting straight on. And the guy would stand up over her and look down and say, I can see the cleavage. I said, you can see the cleavage from where you stand. The camera can't say, won't do. We don't make those kind of movies.